Welcome to On Demand Worship. My name is Lane Watkins. I'm the Director of Contemporary Worship here at the downtown campus of the Cathedral of the Rockies. On behalf of the entire staff, we are so grateful that you continue to tune in week after week. If you're watching us on Facebook, make sure to hit that like button so that you can stay updated on all the cathedral happenings. If you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and click subscribe so that you can check out the archives. You'll catch all of the music video releases as well as some mini sermons every once in a while. Today we are launching into a new series about grace. Pastor Duane will be with us shortly, but now we invite you to sit back, maybe light a candle, and sing with us as the band leads us in a song. Love crosses every divide With heart to see through other eyes Bridges the distance wrought by fear Forges ways to draw us near
Grace and peace, friends. My name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here at Cathedral of the Rockies, Boise First United Methodist Church. Today, I'm at Coiled Winery. You might say, what? Well, just hold on. Stay with me. You'll understand why in a few minutes why we're here. I just want to say to you, if you don't have a church pastor, I'd be honored to be your pastor. And if you don't have a church home, we would be honored to be your church home. You will see an email address here on the screen. And if you're new, email me. I'd love to help you get connected and be part of the body of Christ around the world that calls Cathedral of the Rockies home. We can together make a different world. Now, normally I end the message with these four things, and I'm going to start, it, start the message today with these four things. Know these four things. You are loved by and you matter to God. No crisis will last forever. There is always hope, and others can help. Just ask. Now that, that, that third one in there may feel like, I'm not sure you're right anymore, Pastor Duane. No crisis will last forever. Or the second one, I guess. No crisis will last forever. It feels like COVID goes on and on and on. And maybe as you watch the numbers, right now it kind of does. So I want to say to you, Love your neighbor. When you're in community, wear a mask. If you're able, get the vaccine. I myself was in a vaccine trial all of last year and since then have gotten the vaccine. Encourage you to get the vaccine if you're able so that together we can make a different world. Thank you for loving your neighbor and for being a community that loves. Now, Phil Yancey tells a story. Phil writes a, a number of great books, and he tells a story of meeting a woman who was living on the edge. Basically, she was out of money. She was homeless. She was unable to buy food for her two-year-old child. They were at the end of the possibilities. And he writes, I asked her, have you considered going to the church? And her reply was, why would I ever go to a church? They would just make me feel guilty. Wow. Mark Twain told this story. He said, I put a dog and a cat in a cage. It's an experiment to see if they could get along. He said they did all right. So I added a bird and a, a pig and a goat. And after a few adjustments, they did all right. So I added a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Catholic. Soon after, he said, there wasn't a living thing. Wow, so often our world runs on ungrace. What does the world learn by looking at us? Beginning next week, we're gonna do a new series that's called If Grace Is True. But here on the holiday weekend, we're gonna do a prequel in a sense, and we're gonna ask, what is grace? What is grace? Maybe immediately you hear an echo of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Those words of that slave ship captain who was changed by grace. He was influenced by a Methodist preachers and he became a pastor. John Newton wrote those words and he taught us that grace saves, grace finds us. Grace gives us new sight. Grace, in his words, is amazing. I want to take you today to the Gospel of John and chapter 2. We're going to put this text on the screen. And wherever you are, would you read these holy words out loud with me? Let's engage the text. Read with me. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Wow. I love the message translation of that last verse. Jesus says it this way. Jesus said, Is that any of our business, mother? Yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. What is grace? Grace baffles us. 
Does grace push us? They have no more wine. Does grace, does grace push us? So let's, let's go through the whole story. Jesus and his disciples and his mother are at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. So John tells us specifically where they are. He gives us a time and place. They're, they're north of Nazareth. If you look at the map, they're north of Jerusalem. They would be to the west of the Sea of Galilee, about eight miles north of Nazareth. They're at a wedding. Now, weddings are big moments, not just an hour or two like you and I might think. They, as you can tell in the text, three days they've been at the wedding. I mean, that's a party. And three days into the wedding, they run out of wine. Jesus' mom says to Jesus, they're out of wine. Jesus' response is, why are you talking to me? (laughs) What's that got to do with me? Why are you bringing up this issue to me? And then he says, my hour has not come. Now his mother doesn't stop. She looks to the waiters in a sense and says, do whatever he says. An interesting phrase, isn't it? Do whatever Jesus says. I mean, what would our life be like if we did what Jesus said? Jesus, we don't know what the time frame is there, takes a moment. Now John interjects. At the wedding ceremony, there are six ceremonial jars for for ceremonial cleansing, Jewish cleansing, religious cleansing, according to Leviticus. These jars, he says, are big. They hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. Jesus says to the stewards, the servants of the day, fill them up to the brim. Fill them up with water. They fill them up. Then Jesus gives another instruction. Take a scoop of that water to the master of ceremonies. They take a scoop of water to the master of ceremonies. No one sees anything change. No, there's no bang, there's no flash, nothing happens. The master of ceremonies takes a drink and goes, what is going on? He says, normally you give the good wine first and you save the cheap wine for later. Once people are a little light on their feet, you bring out the cheap wine. But you've saved the best for last. Wow. Wow. This is a change in norms, a change in reality. The water has become wine. Then John adds, to make sure we understand, John adds, this miraculous sign at Cana of Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, the first time the disciples believed in him. Could it be when grace is lived, others will believe in God? Wow. Now, this is an interesting miracle to me. Often in the membership class, I'll talk about this as this is the first miracle in the the book of John. And we're only two chapters in. And the first miracle is not a healing. The first miracle is not Jesus casting demons out of someone whose life is in danger. The first miracle is not Jesus feeding 5,000 or walking on the water or a blind person receiving sight. The first miracle is turning water into wine. Is that grace? You know, Jesus never defines grace. Throughout the scriptures, Jesus does not define grace. Let me attempt to define grace. Grace is the unconditional love of God. Grace, God's grace, expands our capacity to love others. Jesus doesn't define grace, but Jesus lives grace constantly. So we're out of wine. Why does Mary notice this? I mean, that's where I went as I looked at the story. So what? Why does Mary notice they're out of wine? Because go back in Mary's story. You remember when Mary was engaged to Joseph? Do you remember when Mary was pregnant through the Holy Spirit? Mary knows shame. Mary knows embarrassment. Mary recognizes the pain that can cause. You might remember before, G- before Joseph understood what was taking place, the scripture says Joseph had in mind to divorce her quietly so that he would dis- keep her from experiencing disgrace. 
disgrace. And then the angel shows up and says, Mary, uh, Joseph, this is a God thing. God's involved. Take Mary as your wife. To run out of wine, it's disgrace. To run out of wine is shame. Shame for this brand new marriage. Shame in the community. Shame and embarrassment that they are poor planners of weddings. Maybe just shame and embarrassment that they're poor. Mary, who's received grace, wants to stop the shame. They're out of wine. Jesus, do something. And Jesus replies with an interesting response. It's not my time. Why why do you ask me? It's not my time. What do you think Jesus is thinking about? I think Jesus is thinking about what every unmarried person thinks about when they attend a wedding. Will I ever get married? What will my bride be like? What will my spouse be like? Will I ever have this moment? Jesus is hesitating because he's thinking about you, the church. The scripture says you are the bride of Christ. Later in the next chapter, chapter 3, verse 29, it reads like this. Jesus is speaking and he says, It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Jesus is thinking about the beloved, us, the church, the body of Christ. The scripture says we are the bride of Christ. When Jesus says, it's not my time, he's saying, it's not my time to live grace yet. Or is it? As his mother pushes him, they're out of wine. Jesus has a decision to make. Will you do something? They are out of wine. Do something. You know, almost every day the world looks at you and me and says, do something. You're a Christian, right? You believe in Jesus, right? Do do something. I mean, every day the world cries. There's trouble at the border. Do something. Systemic racism, do something. Global warming, do something. Earthquakes in Haiti, storms in the east, do something. A 50-year-old experiment called the United Methodist Church seems to be in chaos. Do something. Opioids and addictions killing our loved ones. Do something. And so often when we hear do something. We, 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 like Jesus, say, what could I do? I, it's not my time. That's too political. Martin Niemöller, who was a Lutheran pastor during World War II, wrote these words. First they came for the Jews, but I did nothing because I am not a Jew. Then they came for the socialists, but I did nothing because I'm not a socialist. Then they came for the Catholics, but I did nothing because I am not a Catholic. Finally, they came for me, but by then there was no one left to help me. Grace invites us to do something. Years ago, the country singer Martina McBride wrote this great song with this line. She says this, you can spend your whole life building something from nothing and one storm can come and blow it all away. Build it anyway. Do something. The grace of God in Mary invited her to call forth grace in Jesus to do something. Grace stops shame. Grace turns water into wine. Grace loves beyond expectation. Well, as we enter this new series next week, let me give you a couple action steps, some things we can do. First, I want to invite you to do this. Receive grace. Would you receive grace? See, Mary had received grace, so she saw the possibility of sharing it with others. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more or less. That's what grace teaches us. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less. God just loves you. 
Would you receive that? Okay, here's the second. Give grace. We have multiple crises going on in the world. And literally, people are saying, do something. So the hurricane went through the east, and the United Methodist Committee on Relief is present. They were helping people respond. You want to do something? Give through the church to the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Or Google it and give directly to them if you want. Also, in the midst of COVID-19, do something. We can give through the UNICEF program, Love Your Neighbor, in the pandemic. It's on our website. 36 bucks is what it costs to put a shot in your arm. 36 bucks will take 10 people in the two-thirds world and help them have a future. Do something. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. In the midst of Afghanistan, Haiti, gun violence, hurricanes, and our personal storms, we pray these things. For those who are fleeing, God, we pray the word sanctuary. For those who are staying, we pray the word safety. For those who are frightened, we pray peace. For those who are Heart, whose hearts are breaking, we pray comfort. For those who see no future, we pray hope. And for those who are empty, we pray grace, grace that turns water into wine. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now we're going to take a moment where we gather our kids, or at least in our minds, our kids and grandkids. Maybe even grab a picture and we invite God to be present with them. Let's enter into this time of prayer. Hello, church. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stacy Ballard, and I am the Family Life Pastor here at Cathedral of the Rockies. I'm one of the newest additions to the staff, and I have to tell you that I serve the community of Boise and beyond with the most incredible group of people here. It is such a gift to serve our community with you. I am so very grateful. And this is a church that deeply cares about the children. As you think about the kiddos in your life that you know it may be easy for you to recall moments gathered around the table with them. I grew up in a family where it was really important to always say grace before we had a meal. Maybe your family is like this even now, right? <laughs> uh, but now that I have a family of my own, this is still something that we practice together, giving thanks before we share a meal together. But when I was growing up, if we took a bite of food before we prayed over it, it was almost like we expected the food to just spontaneously combust in our mouths, right? Because it wasn't blessed, because we hadn't prayed over it yet. Maybe you can relate to this, maybe not. Uh, maybe you didn't grow up in the church or your church experience wasn't like this. I, I don't know, but as, as my family practices saying a prayer before meals together now, I never want it to be lost on my girls why it is that we are praying and giving thanks. Family prayers can be a really silly time, but I want them to experience practiced rhythms of gratitude, being thankful to God. There is always something to be thankful for, even on the cloudiest of days. So whatever your week has held for you, I pray that your heart too would find thankfulness, that you would be reminded of silly prayers around the dinner table from little ones practicing giving thanks. There's something so beautiful about looking at the world through a child's eyes and the innocence of their prayers. As my three-year-old daughter <laughs> likes to say when she says grace before a meal, cheesy food, amen, or the translated version, Jesus food, amen. Now it's time to give back. We give you an opportunity each week to partner with us in ministries that need your help financially. The giving information will be on the screen. You can give online at our website or you can text to give. Thank you for your generosity and for the way that you help grow this community, both here in the Treasure Valley and all across the world. We appreciate you and we love you. Hello.
My name is Dustin Herring. I'm one of the founders of Water and Light. We live and work in Salinas Grande, Nicaragua, but our roots are actually right here in the Northwest. In fact, my brother Mark Herring was a worship leader at your church a few years back. About four years ago, my family and I moved to a remote fishing village in Nicaragua where we work with the community to provide better access to water and education. When we first started poking around the water issue, we learned that the water in the well is clean, but it flows down an old pipe system that's been broken and added on to many times. This contaminates the water and people feel poorly when they drink it. That then leads to kidney disease and dehydration. 
The thing about this water issue is there's no quick fixes. It's got many layers. And we interviewed our neighbor Mercedes and one of our students to help you get a little picture of what they're dealing with. Bueno, es que esta agua la agarramos a ver para tomar. Esa agua es para tomar. Sí. Y que no viene el agua diaria. Que si viniera agua diaria, no tengo necesidad de estar agarrando este poco de agua. Lo más que viene son tres horas el agua, entonces necesitamos más porque este afecta a todas las comunidades. For the last three years, through a revolution and a pandemic, we've been working alongside the community to hand dig 15 kilometers of brand new pipe and install a new well. In fact, right now, we're in the final stages of connecting all the homes to the new system. As soon as that's finished, we'll turn on the water and then we'll begin an education component where we'll teach our neighbors about the benefits of clean water and also install hand washing stations and drinking fountains in the local schools. We are so humbled and grateful to be partnering with you in your Wine to Water event. Thank you so much. And guess what? If you would ever like to come see your impact firsthand, we've got a place for you in Nicaragua. Come and visit. We're here at Coiled Wineries. You might say, why were you there? Yes, we talked about the story with Jesus turning water into wine, but we as a church are gonna have an event called Wine to Water. Information's on your screen, you can see about it. Go to the website and we will gather together for fellowship, for fun, and Coiled Winery will bring the wine and together the money you spend on the wine and time together in the band, that money will go to make clean water wells in another part of the world. What a great way to be world changers and grace givers together. So sign up for wine to water. Let me give you the benediction as we celebrate this time and have this holiday weekend together. Friends, may the peace of Jesus Christ go with you wherever God leads you. May God walk with you in the wilderness. May God hold you in the storms of life. May God bring you home rejoicing at the amazing things you've experienced together. May God bring you home rejoicing once again through these doors in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.